Добрый вечер. Good evening. I would like to greet all the participants of the Northern Forum of the Special Session on Human Adaptation in the Arctic. Tonight we're here to uh, talk about the issues on human adaptation in the Arctic, and this issue has been discussed a lot. This topic is very topical, and the changes that we're seeing now in the Arctic in terms of climate change, in terms of in industry, in terms of uh, exploring the North and globalization, they are obvious, they are clear, and that's why today it is very important to study modern uh, condition of human adaptation in the Arctic, to think about the future strategy. To study this question, we need all the scientists from different um, different fields. We need interdisciplinary approach. That's why we are here tonight. We have all the representatives from different fields, from the government, and tonight we'll have 11 speakers from different countries, including Russia, uh, Yakutsk, Moscow. We'll have uh, speakers from Norway, from Finland, and from the United States. And let me give the floor to the organizer of this session to the uh, head of the International UNESCO Department from the Northeastern Federal University, Anatoly Zhozhikov. Hello, dear participants of the Human Adaptation in the Arctic session. Um, this session is held by the UNESCO Department of the NEFU, which gained uh, the network university status this year. The thing is that uh, lately, lately, because the Arctic is being explored very actively now, we are facing the problem of human adaptation in the Arctic. And uh, people of the Arctic has received the, the experience, they gained the experience on adaptation. Unfortunately, lately we've been seeing the mm, different problems uh, resulted from uh, industrial exploration of the Arctic, of globalization. And as the result, we're afraid that we won't be able to stop this um, degradation. That's why we need to come together with all the scientists and with the communities of indigenous people. And on this topic, uh, we became uh, partners with Norway colleagues. And on the 27th, on this forum, we have discussed this um, issue on um, reindeer herders adaptation in the uh, conditions of climate change. Adaptations uh, de depend on many factors, such as medicine, social factors, cultural factors, and so on. That's why we need to work in a complex way. And I would like to wish everyone a fruitful work and diff interesting reports. Thank you very much. So I'd like to give uh, the floor to Svein Mattison, professor from Sami University of Applied Sciences, with his report on feasibility study for co-production of knowledge between researchers and indigenous communities for adaptation to climate change. Please, Mr. Mattison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hope you could hear me. And can you see my presentation? Can you see my presentation? Uh, right now we cannot see your presentation. Could you try it again, please? I uploaded the presentation. Probably you should you try see? to share your screen. I did. You can't see anything. No, right now we cannot see your presentation. 
Uh, please try to press twice. You need to try twice. Try to click twice on your screen. Okay, sorry. Okay, she's right. Do you see now? Yes, now we can see. Yeah, now it works. Okay. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, it's uh, fantastic that you are willing to come to the session so late in the evening to meet us living in Europe. Uh, I assume you will have uh, uh, the Russian language uh, simultaneously. I will tell you about a joint project we do with UNESCO chair at NEFU and uh, the UARTIC Institute for Reindeer Husbandry and the International Center for Reindeer Husbandry in Norway. Um, we also include Finland. It's about using traditional knowledge to adapt to the Arctic changes. But first, before I move into my uh, lecture, I give you a news. Uh, International Center for Reindeer Husbandry, together with University of Arctic, has developed a course at Harvard University about how future indigenous leaders should deal with those changes. We just heard uh, uh, the professor at NEFU talked about. And we host that course in January. We invite all of you to participate. You see here, that's the registration link. It will be provided in both English and Russian language. It's a one week for the future indigenous leaders of the Arctic. And we have made it, Harvard is hosting it. It's all about the change. It's very cool. Please join us. I hope later we could adapt the same thing and hold it at NEFO. So the International Center for Reindeer Husbandry uh, was established in 2005 as part of the uh, Arctic strategy of Norway at that time. And we have an international border uh, at our center working in the circumpolar north. The new Arctic strategy for Norway was established in 2017. And in that strategy, it says something about our reindeer center. It actually says um, that uh, should strengthen the international reindeer husbandry cooperation contribute to maintain and further develop sustainable reindeer husbandry in the high north. Among the things International Center for Reindeer works closely with is reindeer herders in Russia. In that document, you also find that indigenous people cooperation in the Arctic co contributes to increase awareness and respect of the indigenous people's culture and rights of all Arctic countries. That's the Norwegian Arctic strategy today. It's focus on an indigenous peoples and international cooperation, in particular reindeer husbandry. Just now we are making a new Arctic strategy and the same text uh, is in and we will continue to work with uh, between reindeer herders in the Arctic. We need more cooperation in the Arctic not less cooperation because of the changes. This is why we launched this concept of co-production of knowledge, the scientific knowledge and the indigenous people's knowledge. So now with all the changes we see in Sakaya Kutia, we have to use all the best available knowledge existing. You have a long history of academic high standards. We have to use all that knowledge but we also have to use the Chukchi, Evian, Yokagir, Evenkin knowledge to produce the best plans for the future. 
That's why we have made this project in uh, Norfolk, that's Nordic uh, Council of Ministers, is a feasibility study. We're going to test a method. This is some of our participants in January in Norway. So it's about gathering a small group of reindeer herders and talk to them, discuss with them, listen to their knowledge. So it's about what is your focus in the past related to climate change, focus in present, what's happening in your community today, um, what is the future scenarios, and do we have some common ground to discuss? Here, for example, we were discussing, discussing snow here in, in Norway. Snow was our common ground. And how do we make action for plans together with our uh, authorities? How do we plan for changes? This is the core activity we do with Saka, Kutia, Finland, and Norway. And that's allow Rainerhoods traditional knowledge. But we also develop new tools to share knowledge because between indigenous herders and scientists. This is mapping, looks very strange, but it's a map. So we work in Cherski in northern part of Sakakutia. And co-production of knowledge. How do you co-produce the pasture, the snow condition in Sakakutia? Here you have the Hargen in the background, the Hargen reindeer is a Danish scientist who works with us. And, and uh, reindeer herders from northern Sakakutia. Yes, it's cold. This is the rector at the uh, Arctic College. And this is Al uh, Alona Gerasimov from Neringri. It's very cold, it's minus 50. But still, you see in this area uh, that air temperature since 1970 has increased in Cherisky with more than all, uh, more than 6.4 degrees. Six, you're not talking about two degrees increase as you talk about uh, globally, but you talk about 2.6.5 degrees. This is enormous, you know? And this is a rector at the Arctic College and that kind of warming makes more snow. More snow, warming make more snow. In... And of course the other challenge as we have experienced this summer is the fires. That's the fires which also increase. So what is the past history of the fires in Sakakut, northern Sakakutia? What is the language of Yukagiran fires? And what is the present? How do we actually deal with those fires? I think authorities in Sakya Kutia is working very efficiently to try to make some plans for the forest and tundra fires in the future. Because we are close to tipping points in some communities. Um, and this is where we really would like to use this Norfolk feasibility uh, method to co-produce the knowledge of indigenous people in Sakakutia with scientific knowledge to make sure that we produce proper recommendation so authorities in Sakakutia could plan better for the future. We also work in southern Sakakutia in uh, Iengra the increase in air temperatures is not that dramatic, but here you see we have very good air temperatures back to 1920. And here it's an increase in spring air temperature in Nieringri. It's Schulman actually at the airport, uh, which is 3.6 degrees. Someone has to give me a sign when I should close the talk off. Um, so you see, yes, even Southern Sakya Kutia is increasing, but not to the extent which we have in the north. And the same, this picture is taken from a Venki reindeer herder in Southern Sakya Kutia this, this uh, winter. Lots of snow. 
at the same time, as our my co uh, Madam Co Chair said, industrial development are challenging the Arctic nature. This is also from Sakya Kutya. How are we going to cool the Vela in a peaceful relationship between each other? I think, we think it's possible to balance, to have the reindeer's knowledge to improve also their economy in the future. What about Norway? I'm living over here. You know, I'm there now. I really miss Saka Kutia, I must say that. I'm soon coming when COVID is gone because it's going to get disappear. So this was this winter, lots of snow here too. And you see here, we have one meter of snow in the middle of the winter. This was an extreme winter. A lot of reindeer was dying. But you see, Norway in the north is not so cold. Um, uh, winter starts in October, and but it ends last part of May. Excuse me, Professor Madison, you have about uh, half a minute left. That's okay. So. Our project is to test methods here in Norway, because we have the same climate uh, conditions, snow conditions, we have the same extreme industrial development in Norway. How do we actually develop methods for co-production to make sure that we have good recommendations for the future planning? This is about adaptation to those changes. We believe in it. We should have people in the Arctic also in the future. It's possible, but we have to work together. In this report from the Interact, uh, International Center for Reindeer Husbandry, actually produced some guidelines and recommendations to guide us into this difficult world. So by this word, I will say thank you. And um, it's really nice to participate. Uh, I'm. I invite you to come up with some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Madison, for this presentation. Now I'd like to give the floor to Anders Oskol, the director of the International Institute of Reindeer Husbandry. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, first we thank the organizers for uh, arranging this timely and important uh, session. Uh, the issue of adaptation uh, across the Arctic reindeer herding societies is, is of great importance. Uh, as we see these changes, which uh, our colleague Professor Matisse have have elaborated, and. Um, I would also like to thank especially the, the government of the Sakha Republic, uh, who has uh, for uh, 30 years been pioneering the support to the International Reindeer Herders Collaboration. Uh, without the support of, of the Republic, we would not have uh, the international uh, functioning collaboration between the 24 indigenous reindeer herding peoples of the world. So we are very grateful for that. And we are also grateful because Saka Republic in many respects are a pioneer when it comes to the policy towards reindeer herding. And uh, of course, supporting our World Congress in 2005 is one thing. The policies toward uh, the nomadic school concepts, development developing the proper education for for uh, indigenous reindeer herders and of course uh, the, the progressive and very sensible policies towards uh, predator population management is very impressive uh, when we look at uh, the policies of the republic to name a few examples and uh, of course we when we talk about uh, adaptation um, to, to these great changes, um, there is a need to ask ourselves what could be the, the, the core components of defining uh, adaptation strategies, both on the policy level 
but also on the level of, of ranger herding community. As far as the policy level goes, I think it is absolutely critical to realize that the changes we have before us are of such proportions that we need to use the best available knowledge. And science has been and will be even more important in the future. But even more uh, critical, I think, is to make sure we, we understand better, respect and take into use the traditional knowledge of uh, ranger herders, who, after all, uh, have been uh, not only surviving, but thriving in the Arctic for decades, centuries, and millennia. And also, I think we, we should ask ourselves what kind of system is best able to adapt to change, to, to extreme variable environment. Uh, where the variability is increasing uh, every day. Uh, is it uh, the, the large units uh, or is it the, the smaller units uh, of ranger herding? I think we could learn a lot by looking at the experience in the fish processing, uh, the, the fishing sector of, of uh, Norway and, and Iceland, for instance, where there was a policy in building up large locomotives, uh, large units to pursue uh, the, the scale, uh, scale uh, advantages. But as the environment, as the natural conditions varied a lot, uh, this resulted in uh, a large uh, number of uh, bankruptcies. And thus, this, these large structures were not uh, so well adapted to, to handle such amounts of change. And we could transfer this into thinking about ranger husbandry, where initially we all, we only had the, the private ranger herding, where uh, private ranger herders made the adaptation on the lower, lower scale, as we have now today also uh, larger units, the collective farms, we need to ask ourselves what is the best system for the future. Also given that adaptation is not only about planning, but it is about initiative and it's about leadership. But anyway, I uh, once again want to thank the organizers for this, this timely and uh, interesting session. And I will uh, follow the, the session with great interest and uh, I uh, wish a successful outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Indeed, the question of using traditional knowledge along with the scientific knowledge is very important. Now let me give the floor to our next speaker, Ivanova Razania, researcher of uh, the Laboratory of Cryogenic Landscapes at the uh, Permafrost Institute, a member of the Regional Council of the RGS. Scientist, uh, scientist with a report on activation of cryogenic processes under the influence of climate change and anthropogenic pressure in the Land River Basin. Good evening, dear participants of the session. I'm very glad to greet you at our session and let me introduce my uh, research. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you already know the title, the name of my research. So the expedition of, on the Lena River uh, took place in summertime in 2018-2019 on the Lena River on the ferry. Uh, so uh, over a very short time, we managed to uh, go through more than 2,000 kilometers. And on a map, you can see the points where we have been to. And we've been on a board with uh, Irkutsk Oblast. That's where we started. And we reached uh, the Tixi. 
это, это, этот район This region is characterized by a very diverse, uh, by a very diverse uh, permafrost, and here it is very thick. And in some regions, uh, it can be isolated or in islands. So the character of the temperatures is very wide. It varies from uh, zero degrees to minus nine degrees. The capacity of the permafrost is varies from 50 meters to 700 meters. This is how the permafrost is spread. Uh, the most difficult character has the uh, uh, southern west of the Lena River Basin, where the permafrost has an um, island-like character and massive island character. The capacity of uh, seasonal melting can reach uh, six meters, and in some uh, places we have found extremely uh, close close permafrost to the uh, ground. Uh, the permafrost has a very high temperature from zero degrees and a little bit lower. Uh, modern climate is changing very intensively. It rises, it is rising, which has been proven all over the world. And in Lena River Basin, the character of changes of the climate is shown as a rising temperature of the air. <coughs> I won't be talking too much about this. So on the pictures, you can see the dynamics of the temperature changes from 1930 to 2017. As well, you can see the uh, index of melting, uh, which can show us how the permafrost has been, uh, has been changing over the years. So we'll go from south to the north, and uh, we won't see uh, very uh, drastical changes, but we can see that in central Yakutia, where the meteor station Yakutsk is, the average temperature has risen over this period by three degrees, and the index of melting has changed by uh, nine days. It is quite a lot. And in the north, the picture is, uh, and the tendency are pretty much the same. Uh, despite different conditions, and they mostly uh, depend on uh, common general uh, geographical zonality, zoning, even such a uh, southern region, it's uh, Vikim, it's in the uh, south of the Sahara Republic. We have uh, uh, discovered a permafrost, uh, which was still there in July, and it was on 25 meters deep. It is not much at all, considering uh, high temperatures of the air, it is very concerning because the climate is indeed uh, changing and it getting, it's getting uh, warmer. And the permafrost uh, melting are shown in these uh, pictures. So these are the processes that are happening in the ground. It's about uh, 10 and more meters deep in the ground. But all these processes are brightly shown on the surface. So this is the ice complex, how, how the um, underground ice came out 
we have discovered it in the Lena Basin. They have not melted completely yet, but they are there. And they are started to melt, and these were found in the south of the Republic. You can see that um, these pictures can uh, tell us that uh, the, the ice is quite humid, and um, this melting happened over the last several years. Over the whole territory of the basin, such processes as thermocaster are very spread, and there are lots of um, other water sources uh, starting to appear. For example, uh, this is the Balikdakh uh, lake close to the Salyanka village. Until uh, recent times, there was a, a motorway, but in 2018, we have discovered that uh, this road is not there anymore. That, uh, it has melted, this little bridge. And there is like a hole there, three meters uh, deep, three meters wide. The reason for um, this is that uh, there are not very far some mobile, uh, so some motorways are near. But not only natural processes can lead to this. Of course, uh, um, anthropogenic activity uh, can inf contribute to such uh, events. For example, this is is Alokminsky region, and in 1985, on Spartivne Street, there was a dry land, but now there is a thermocastric lake, which is getting wide, uh, 12 centimeters each year. And this is a small lake as a result of human activity. And a human decided to make a swimming pool inside of his land, on his land. Agricultural territories in the south of Sahai Kutia and in the central part of the Republic are mostly situated in the places where there were forests before. So these places are abandoned, no one is using them, but still uh, some parts of these agricultural places are still operating and provides population people with uh, grain. So this is an abandoned uh, land and people are starting to build uh, houses there. So this is a micro region Salosun and over the 20 years the surface has uh, changed so much that these buildings that these houses are, cannot operate at all and here so these lands are getting abandoned because there are such uh, small hills appearing there. And thermal erosion is also taking place in these regions. So this um, this happened. All everything that you see on the picture it happened over the several last years. And this small hall um, was made, appeared there only over one day because of the hard rains. And all these processes taking place because of the climate changes, because the surface is uh, getting uh, worse. 
and uh, widely spread our ice building uh, that uh, was a danger to the infrastructure of uh, people back then, a couple of decades ago, and cutting down forests that took place in the 40s, 50s. So this picture was made in 2018, and over 70 years, uh, nothing has changed, nothing has grown up there, and that's why in Creolitho zone it's uh, dangerous to cut the forests down. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Indeed, this topic is very topical, and we know that in the Lena River Besan there are more than 90% of the uh, Republic population uh, inhabited, and because of the permafrost melting, a lot of greenhouses, greenhouse gases are uh, happening. Uh, and now I'd like to give uh, the floor uh, to Pagadayev Mikhail, um, the Deputy Minister on the, um, on the Deputy Minister uh, for the Development of the Arctic and Affairs of the Peoples of the Sahara Republic. Uh, good evening, dear participants of the round table. I will continue with the topic of reindeer herding that was the starting one at our round table. And I would like to speak not as a deputy minister, maybe, but rather than a researcher. And uh, I would like to speak about adaptation of reindeer herding in Yakutia to those changes that our colleagues uh, mentioned, uh, climate change, globalization, connected to economic development of the territories. And it's a pleasure to see our friends from Norway. I prepared a presentation together with our colleagues from International Reindeer Herding Center and the World Reindeer Herders. Uh, the thing is that for over quite a long period of time I've been engaged in uh, developing international ties between indigenous peoples, reindeer herders, because I was the chairman of the uh, World Reindeer Herders. And that's why I chose this topic. Reindeer herding is existing in 10 countries of the world. You can see them all in this map. Over 24 indigenous peoples are engaged in reindeer herding. And as you can see, it's almost all of the Arctic states where there are reindeer herding in China, in Mongolia, and even in Scotland. Uh, and uh, if we mention the Sahara Republic, I will start by mentioning that in uh, this republic we have indigenous peoples of the north, we have five of them. Those, all of these are engaged in reindeer herding. It's the main type of economy in the Northern Territories. And we see that the uh, uh, change of the number of these indigenous peoples over the last years, uh, it's getting larger, they're increasing, there are new communities being created. And uh, you can see the, the map of these places where they reside and they do their traditional economy. Uh, besides, we have 52 territories of traditional land use in our republic that are protected areas. Uh, with a special regime of land use, and uh, these territories are used for reindeer herding, among others. And uh, the number of uh, communities is growing. Over 10 years, it has doubled, uh, and these uh, Ancestral communities, they are doing uh, their 
they are engaged in the traditional economy. And today the Sahara Republic is developing a strate strategic documents on the development of Arctic Zone of our Republic. Uh, recently the head of the Republic adopted this strategy of social and economic development of the Arctic Zone and one of the priorities in this strategy is renewable resources and the activities linked to it, like reindeer herding, fishing, hunting, etc. And that's why traditional economies are still playing a very important role in the development and the life of our territories. Now to reindeer herding, the population, you can see it on the slide, by uh, districts we see the numbers of in our republic, we have uh, several zones of reindeer herding. They are very different from each other. Tundra forest, tundra forest, mountain forest, mountain tundra. And uh, there are 106 uh, reindeer herding uh, companies in our republic. Uh, here you can see that unfortunately for us the behavior of the reindeer population is negative. Uh, there is more and more reindeer, uh, there is less and less reindeer every year and less people employed in reindeer herding. And we have to ask ourselves why it's happening. There is a whole range of reasons and factors for that. Complex economical situation, undeveloped infrastructure, very hard conditions of labor, low payments, a whole range of problems they are facing. And we keep repeating that we don't have have enough people in reindeer herding. We have problems uh, uh, with predators as well. Uh, right now uh, there is a lot of killings by predators. Uh, probably that's also due to those climate changes that are happening right now. Climate changes, as well as uh, industrial development, as well as forest fires, everything influences the migration of wild animals. And we see that today we have a lot of uh, reindeer killed by predators. So all of these problems are also present uh, around the world. And they are as well relevant for our region. Loss of pastures, uh, climate change that Mr. Matheson mentioned, economic and social standing of reindeer herders that we feel here. Um, the uh, extinction of forest reindeer herding. And all these communities, they face one challenge. How should we build sustainable reindeer herding? Herding under such circumstances. Over the last hundred years we faced so many changes that our ancestors never faced. For example, you can see in uh, southern Yakutia, the industrial development is also very, very uh, intense and large scale. Uh, there are special laws in the Republic that protect the interests and rights of indigenous peoples for their traditional land use and uh, resource use. We have to keep this balance between economic development on one hand and traditional cultures on the other hand. In Tundra zone, uh, we have other problems. We still don't have so much industries there, but probably it will happen in the future. But today it's mostly social and economic problems. Uh, underdeveloped infrastructure, remoteness, 
все это влияет. И вот основной вопрос, который In some regions, in countries, it's already endangered uh, pretty critically. So here, I would like to show this slide. We did it with colleagues when we were in the Reindeer Herders of the World Association and we're cooperating with uh, uh, experts. I would like to bring uh, Robert Corral from USA, and uh, how should uh, indigenous peoples adapt to change in the Arctic? So this is the formula. Vulnerability is equals impact minus adaptive capacity. From this formula we see that in order to safeguard these types of activities, we have to increase adaptiveness, adaptive capacity. What is adaptive capacity? Knowledge that uh, the reindeer, reindeer herders have. Uh, knowledge that uh, allowed them to live for thousands of years. So increasing competency of uh, indigenous peoples uh, is crucial. Today it's not enough just to be a good reindeer herder. You have to know a lot of things. So there are new initiatives like Arctic Skills, uh, skill contests that are aimed at developing skills. Uh, we also, 10 years ago, we also, when we, I was in the rain, World Reindeer Herders, we were talking about remote education. We were trying to build some distant learning platforms, we held some classes online, we were teaching young leaders, and today coronavirus actually made us uh, do it right now in real life. And that's why we think that it's crucial to create institutes, to develop indigenous peoples, to support them. And without institutional development, that's going to be hard for vulnerable communities to stand against the changes. What resources we have? First of all, of food. Uh, I think we should also pay attention to that. So this is a project uh, we are working together on with uh, the Sahara Republic and World Reindeer Her Herders, which has to do with uh, the food culture of reindeer herders and trying to attract young people into that so that they can see, learn, at the same time keeping their cultural identity, knowledge, and transferring it on to future generations. The main project uh, is connected with how the Arctic change can be an opportunity. For example, Northern Sea Route. Development of Northern Sea Route should not only give benefits to industries, mining. It's your time. It's not only should develop uh, those people who come to these lands, but also it should be beneficial for locals. And that's why we are developing a joint project that uh, has to do with uh, Northern Sea Route, of providing the access uh, to products, providing access to outer markets for the products uh, produced by local communities. Because right now the problem is uh, where to sell and who to sell to. Maybe this scheme, I hope it will, um, provide us accesses to other markets uh, where prices are much higher than we have them now in uh, domestic markets. Again, this uh, is, uh, here we're talking about uh, economic development. 
uh, local communities might also produce their own. Uh, Anders Oskol mentioned, how should we develop further? Of course, we can only live in the Arctic uh, jointly, together. Uh, but there should be motivation. People should have motivation. And I think the future of reindeer herding can be only private, because then they have the incentive, they have the motivation, and from there they will get the higher quality of life. And uh, the state should create uh, conditions for these people to uh, develop their own businesses. And uh, the support for it we see, the support, this approach is supported at international level, that's why I celebrate our cooperation with uh, colleagues from uh, Scandinavia, uh, the projects of introducing new technologies into traditional economies, at the, at the same time keeping our traditional knowledge. So, uh, what is adaptation of Ranger Herd in Arctic? I think it's let them use their own language, let them develop uh, their businesses, and then they can effectively adapt and they can save their language and culture. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, next speaker is about indigenous peoples of the north in the face of climate change. And the floor is given to Vyacheslav Shadrin, vice president of the Association of Indigenous Minorities of the North of the Sahara Public Yakutia and senior researcher of the Institute of Humanities and Problems of Indigenous Peoples. Good evening, dear friends. Today we are discussing the sustainability of our northern communities, of our peoples, and about the changes that are taking place now. And the main question is the question uh, concerning adaptation of indigenous peoples to the climate change. This question is, uh, this issue is very challenging. Indeed, indigenous people are uh, they depend on climate a lot because they are uh, a part of this um, part of this land, a part of uh, their water, this is how they say it, means that each change that have, takes place in the ecosystem um, influences uh, the people. We have a very strong connection with uh, the nature and with the environment that they are living in. And over uh, the thousand years, as we have discussed before, uh, the indigenous peoples have created their own system of communicating with the nature. They've gained their traditional knowledge that has helped them to adapt to such severe uh, northern uh, conditions. However, uh, life is changing, and I won't uh, talk a lot about each uh, point. However, I'd like to say that um, the climate change uh, draws two challenges. It's weather instability and unpredictability of the weather. These are two very important points. And over the last year, the amount of uh, climate anomalies increased dramatically, and every year, uh, we have critical um, critical events every year. And as uh, Mr. Mattison has uh, mentioned, yes, we have challenges of uh, lots of snow. And last year, we have challenges in tundra regions where floods, permanent floods. But suddenly, this year, we have drought and fires in tundra. It is the very first time when we had to face fires in uh, Srednikolimsky region. 
which is a big challenge for us. However, the most important challenge is unpredictability of the weather because uh, all our uh, livelihood was effective when we were able to predict the weather, when we knew what is going to happen, what is going to happen today or tomorrow or next month or next year. And based on this, we could build our surviving strategies, we could uh, choose places where to hunt and time when to go fishing. But now, uh, if we talk about a hunter, for example, he knows for sure where he, sh he should hunt, or a fishman, he knows where he should fish, but now it all has changed. Everything has changed. Not from the point of view of not predicting the weather. The behavior of the animals has also changed a lot. It became unpredictable. Sometimes we can't tell for sure why this animal did that, or why it behaved in such a way. For example, predators are not afraid of human beings now, and they come closer to the settlements, which is a big challenge for us as well. And talking about this, I should uh, say that uh, today the big challenge is that, uh, this possibility of effective ways of adaptation uh, depended on the usage of traditional, traditional knowledge. However, all elders, uh, all people, they say that the nature, as they, how they say it, the nature has stopped trusting us. And they say even that the nature is joking on us, with us. Sometimes we don't know what to do in certain conditions, and it is a very uh, big challenge, and on that depends uh, the uh, livelihood, our livelihood, and it leads to um, our traditional activities becoming less and less effective. I won't uh, talk about the influence on the infrastructure, water regime, which is also a big challenge. And uh, one more thing I would like to mention is the availability of natural resources. Here you can see a map of uh, the places where which uh, indigenous people inhabit, and these are the potential conflicts that are uh, taking place. And you can see that all the territory will where the people, in, uh, indigenous people inhabit, they are marked with uh, small pictures uh, which show us that uh, the situation is very severe, the industrial, uh, the industry goes further north, to the north, and the main challenges of industrial development are that we can lose our lands, that our land uh, degrades, degrades, and the traditional activity is they reduce. So what is the main challenge? Because we are trying to find tools uh, in our dialogue and uh, taking uh, the opinion of indigenous people into consideration. And uh, we should try to uh, find the solution. But for today, these uh, mineral resources and natural resources are not our richness. For most of them, it's sort of a dam. And as our oldest say, we can adapt to everything. And it's been happening over a thousand years. We've been always adapting for everything. But we can't adapt without our land. And I think this is a key point here, a crucial point that the indigenous people are talking about. Yes, we can adapt, but if we save our land, if we preserve it, and this is, I think, one of the key challenges of the um, adaptation in our world for the indigenous people. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh,
А теперь мы с вами переносимся Now в Соединенные Штаты Америки. Мы предоставляем Вера, Виктор профессор Джордж Вашингтон университета. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, dear organizers. And uh, in the previous reports, we've already mentioned the influence of the infrastructure on the life of a human in the Arctic and the ways how the how human should must adapt to the changes. Um, infra as for infrastructure, I'm sorry, I have the presentation in English, but I'll speak Russian. So infrastructure is a very uh, important factor for human adaptation in the Arctic. Um, it improves, improves uh, accessibility to the market, to health, for social services as well. On the other hand, it has negative effects on the environment uh, by, uh, by uh, distracting the nature, the environment. Uh, uh, the larger the scale, the greater effects on economy, on social power and human nature relations. However, when we talk about the development of the infrastructure, we need to keep in mind that it is very much connected with other aspects. For example, the development of Siberia uh, was uh, depended a lot on the development of Trans-Siberian and Transcontinental uh, main lines, and these are the, uh, the changes that it can uh, result in. We can say that uh, all the regions that were around these uh, roads uh, developed uh, drastically. And also, as for pipelines, you can see that it is, it is it has influenced the uh, geostrategic uh, relations, geopolitical relations as well. And the eastern uh, Siberia has developed as well. And they, they have built the Sila Sibiri pipeline, which is, is started in Chayanda gas fields, reaching uh, gas field. You can see that uh, this uh, development has the tunnel effects of uh, transport corridors. And if we talk about the uh, roads, we need uh, to say that on the world map, you can see that Siberia and the Arctic are shown as there are no roads there. And they say that these are the regions uh, where we can save, preserve the nature because it is uh, less accessible for a human being. And that's why our uh, project is connected to uh, roads in uh, subarctic and arctic regions. And we say that these are not only formal, but as well as informal roads. These are the roads that are sort of not official. Maybe they depend on other uh, linear structure, or maybe even the abandoned roads, but which are still used. Or maybe they have very low accessibility. Maybe they were made for special uh, purposes or are being used um, seasonally. The base for our research is uh, the pictures from the space using different uh, maps and landscapes. And of course, I support uh, social questionnaires. And here I am. Sh 
of Kazakhstan's I, uh, I have conducted uh, five interviews in Handi in August 2019 and nine interviews in Tokma in March 2020. Uh, of course, we also use participant observations, environmental impact assessment, and results of the previous researches. Here you can see a map by the students of our university based on uh, the pictures. Uh, uh, from Katansky region. And here is a North Baikal region. And uh, these are the maps of how the roads uh, are developing. And if we look at Kazachinsko Lensky region, we can see how the network of roads has been expanding. Uh, con connected to by Kalamur mainland construction with the discovery of Kavyatkinske gas uh, deposit with the creation of um, other uh, territories that has been used for uh, traditional land use, but now there is a gas uh, deposit. And uh, we also have a pipeline which is reaching this region. The population has changed a lot in this region. And nowadays, um, probably uh, there will be other types of uh, jobs appearing there. Uh, first of all, uh, we uh, identify seismic line clearings in these regions. You can see long lines in the picture on the left. And, um, Hunters use these roads uh, for hunting, for making traps, but since the uh, forest industry is developing now, they have, uh, they have adapted the profile for their uh, usage. And you can see that the network is expanding. Before it, it was only 2D, but now it's 3D. Uh, network. We also have uh, forest industry development here, as the reporters has mentioned before. It has very big negative effects, since here we have the permafrost in this area, and we can see that uh, many different companies, as state companies and private companies, Russian and Chinese companies, that have their own uh, forest roads here, private roads. And for hunters, it means that uh, it changes, it affects the migration of animals. And with the development of Kavichtinska gas deposit, uh, the road has been renewed from Zhigalovo to uh, Baikal Amur uh, main, main road. And Gazprom Dobrycha Company is building this road, and they use uh, different uh, local roads to reach uh, hunting places. And hunters think that because of them, they have more forest fires in the area. And uh, locals, they have uh, unofficial road. As you can see, a drone picture of this road. You can see how it looks from above. Of course, it is uh, not good for the environment, but it gives the opportunity to reach uh, different cities and villages, because in the villages they don't have any infrastructure. And uh, thus, adapting to infrastructure changes, uh, local people see global changes as as a demand for fossil fuel, uh, for uh, climate changes, which uh, leads to the reduction of ice roads and technological advancements. 
as, uh, for example, using different off-road vehicles and development of communication technologies. Of course, however, they have their own human adaptation. They, they build and use already existing infrastructure. They use different off-road vehicles and they adapt to new wind and wildlife. Because as we can see that uh, wild animals, they are also adapting. They use uh, different migration routes. They sometimes even use roads. And uh, local people notice that um, for birds, for birds, uh, birds started uh, picking up gravel on the roads, not on the lake, as they used to do before, and that's why it is very dangerous for them. We can see that uh, both people and animals, they adapt to the changes, but of course it all has its limits. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank my partners and my informants. Thank you very much, Vera Vladimirovna. It is very early at your place, and thank you for sharing such an interesting information with us. Now I would like to give the floor to Anna Stamler, Gosman. A university researcher at the University of Lapland Arctic Center, coordinator of the Arctic Studies program from Finland. Anna Stamler will report on Arctic community living with changes. Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes, we can hear you. Can you see the full on screen? So, hello from Finland. From Finland. Uh, My presentation will be in English. Uh, most people associate climate uh, change with the dramatic melting glaciers, ice bear jumping on the shrinking ice pieces, or extreme weather events. <clears throat> I'm doing my research in places that are not necessarily examples uh, connected to these images. Nevertheless, uh, their residents are experiencing not less dramatic disruptive forces that nature generates to them. Broader public perception has certain difficulties to understand the uh, mundane materiality of climatic changes, their direct impact on human everyday life. We used to hear these kind of statements like Arctic warming will affect the world, but it's not entirely clear how it actually looks like on the ground, how local residents are experiencing changes and how do they deal with them. Today, I will mention two of my research sites. One is in Sahaya Kutia in, and another one is in Norway. In the first case, environmental dynamics are related to the melting permafrost and in Norwegian case, to appearance of new invasive species. In both cases, I will present the local context in which changes are experienced and what kind of adaptive frameworks are existing in these uh, localities. It, doesn't not, it does not matter if I'm talking about community experiences in Norwegian fjord uh, at the Arctic Ocean or Saha settlement, uh, on permafrost grounds in both regions, as elsewhere, processes of physical changes are following major patterns uh, at range of scales concerning meaning um, in relation to social, economic, and political realms, but also to cultural and emotional uh, states of being. Last year, I organized with the great help of my colleagues from Saha, a public event related to degradation of permafrost in the region. Initially planned as a smaller community 
meeting, the event unexpectedly uh, turned out to be of such a great interest. And it became a huge conference with representatives from the regional government, Permafrost Institute, and other academic institutions, but also local uh, administration, young environmentalists, and uh, just local residents. <laughs> Uh, very broad media coverage uh, in TV, uh, in radio news, in social networks, and new uh, newspapers, and international attention afterwards mm -hmm. uh, demonstrated that uh, that the matter of increased dynamics in frozen grounds uh, has become not just abstract environmental issue, but the issue of the broad growing direct impact on people's everyday life. Uh, you just see here a uh, few uh, screenshots from the headlines in the most known international media agencies, BBC, uh, NTV News, or Deutsche Welle, or New York Times. <clears throat> um, presentations during the conference open a massive range of permafrost sensitivities, cultural practices of ice use, disturbances in housing, uh, infrastructure, pastures, danger for dams, but also for human health and well-being, effects of deforestation, flooding, uh, fire. It was important to identify possible practical solutions needed to deal with these problems. Local residents have addressed several legally sensitive questions uh, in this field and missing supportive adaptive measures. At the same time, we all learn about different perspectives of viewing permafrost as a matter of geophysics, engineering, but also as issue of spirituality, cosmology, and traditional uh, beliefs. Accelerating environmental changes in the area are relatively recent, and even young people may say that this place was our playground, a football ground in our childhood with even surface, and now it's just bumpy, eroded field. And local people have started to tackle with that. Uh, some people whose houses are damaged have to move the whole construction to a new spot in the yard. Some live for home places and move to their uh, regional capital. As a reaction uh, on these recent changes, uh, environmental activism has, in, uh, has been uh, initiated and uh, local organization conducted several activities like actions, like preserve our permafrost, school of environmental monitoring, etc. So I would say that human agency initiative has been always a driving factor in adaptive practices of the northern communities, even in the absence of some governmental adaptive efforts. Uh, the same uh, the same informal agency saved the tiny Norwegian community of 200 uh, uh, people, um, village surrounded uh, on all sides uh, by Arctic water, has experienced several changes. Local residents uh, remembered about the collapse of coat stock, fish stock, in the 90s that ruined the economic base of the community. The processing plant was shut down, people lost their jobs, and out migration began. One day, uh, one fisher from the community uh, found uh, in, his, um, in his net a monstrous alien species, the red king crab from Kamchatka. It brought shock and additional uh, uncertainties on how to deal with new changes. Positive changes came to the community after a group of villagers wrote a letter about the situation to the central national newspaper. The publishing of the letter made a tiny village well known overnight. It was a crucial point um, that signified the start of new big terms in the village, uh, a village's life. New economic activity, tourism, was introduced to the remote village. By the end of the 90s, um, uh, there are, uh, an exotic experience for tourists uh, has been uh, offered to take a dip into the water of the Arctic fjords or to swim under northern lights. 
last year brought around 3,000 tourists to this um, small place. So the invasive crab became some kind of blessing to the local economy and contributed to attract tourists. The King Crab Hotel was established, uh, King Crab Safaris are now in the tourist program, and King Crab uh, local food is offered uh, in the village uh, village's restaurant. Nevertheless, the question whether the king crop is burden or asset for the villagers uh, will be not answered by locals in one way. The invasive species help to turn village from uh, being on the brink of extinction into a flourishing tourist place. But the still ongoing discussions on the potential threat um, to ecosystem posed by this uh, species still brings uncertainties in community life. Tourism business is relatively new activity for the fishing village and um, uh, hosting the tourists has been a learning process for all residents. Visitors are very welcome but all community representatives note uh, that the notice that the mass tourism especially in the summertime, is not suitable for such a tiny place. At the same time, residents have to deal all the time with uh, uh, new emerging challenges. For example, uh, the noisy presence of many tourists, increased uh, waste, an increased demand for fuel, uh, the absence of medical services, etc. Mm. Economic diversification um, uh, traditionally is most common medium for coping with changing environmental conditions in the northern communities. But the small rural settlements in the, um, in the north uh, do not have a great variety of opportunities for this kind of diversification. Nevertheless, the residents try to manage to switch their activities within and outside of traditional economies. So to conclude, uh, Northern people in general are experts in adaptation. However, in spite of existing practices in dealing with the changes, the case studies reflect that the um, environmental uh, um, change, uh, envi environment has been uh, has been changing faster than the cultural code. They show that processes in the permafrost or seascape cannot be reduced to uh, just to biophysical characteristics in economic resources. Climate change is as much a social, political, um, as economical uh, phenomenon. So for climate change adaptation programs to be successful, northern communities need to be mainstreamed within broader social processes. Thank you very much. Большое спасибо. Thank you very much uh, for such an interesting presentation. Большое спасибо за интересную презентацию. Мы направляемся в город Москва. Now we're heading to Moscow. And I would like to give the floor to Oksana Lipka, Deputy Director of the Department of Interconnections between the Atmosphere and Terrestrial System, System Research at the Yuri Israel Institute of Global Climate and Ecology with a report on climate change adaptation strategy for Lavozira village. Hello, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for this opportunity to report. Uh, please, could you turn on my presentation? Unfortunately, we're, uh, due to the bad connection, I have no opportunity to demonstrate it. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, so we are in Murmansk Oblast, uh, out of the Arctic Circle on the White Sea shore, the most northern point of Russia. 
Лавозеро uh, is a center of Лавозеро uh, region. Uh, this uh, region, region is not that big. It is uh, the least populated region. So there are about 10,000 10,900 people inhabiting it. So the village itself and the region are known as the uh, remote settlements of Saami in Russia. And there are more than 873 Saami people in this village. As well as around the whole uh, Russia, indigenous peoples, including the Sami people, they noticed the climate change. And that's when we had this idea of not only studying them, but also trying to figure out what to do with it. So this was the idea of the local people themselves. So the idea was to um, bring together the traditional, traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge. And for this reason, we used um, information that was in the open sources so that uh, the locals themselves and other people could compare this information or try to uh, build uh, their own strategy for another settlement. On this picture, you can see a uh, so-called uh, base climate taken from the uh, atlas of the Murmans Oblast in 1971. There is uh, nothing special for this uh, territory that the climate is uh, cold, frosty there, quite humid, with quite warm summer, with a big amount of precipitation. It is all very obvious, but uh, the uniqueness of this territory is that there are a lot of precipitation in summertime and a big um, so that it means that in um, summer and in springtime uh, they have lots of floods and this is the biggest climate challenge in this region, although it's not the only one. And, um, According to the data from Ross Hydro Meteorological Station, we could find out what has changed from this time. There is that the temperature has risen by two degrees. It is more than the global temperature, but it uh, matches uh, the tendency that is happening in Russia. And uh, the temperature rises quite quickly. It's uh, approximately one degree each year, uh, each 10 years. And the thawing of permafrost is also taking place. And the uh, total amount of precipitation is um, it's rising. And the next slide, please. Next. I'm sorry. And uh, the decrease, sorry, not the decrease, but the uh, changing of the precipitation regime. So in winter time, we have more precipitation, as well as we have droughts in summertime. And statistics shows that the amount of uh, water is also rising. Uh, to estimate uh, the changes of the climate, we took the data of the Russian Climate Center uh, in, from St. Pittsburgh. Uh, they uh, compared and they made forecasts for three different uh, periods of time and compared it to the data from the previous century. Here you can see the temperature on the surface and we can expect that by the end of our century we can expect that the temperature will rise by 6 degrees. As well, the uh, maximum uh, temperature in summertime is uh, also rising, but in wintertime temperature it rising even more. And as for the precipitation, it is uh, uh, rising even more. And we have this risk of extreme precipitation, which uh, makes the risks of a flood even higher. 
So what should we adapt to? Unfortunately, the extreme conditions are very hard to model, and based on the tendency, we can do some forecasts. So the main parameters of the climate that we need to adapt to are uh, the rising of the average yearly temperature. Based on different scenarios, it's 4 to 6 degrees. Uh, the rising of the summer temperature by 6 degrees will show us that they will, will have heat, uh, waves of heat that we're having now in the middle uh, Russia. And if you uh, remember about the uh, heat wave in 2010 that took more than uh, hundreds of lives of people. Such events in the north, in northern uh, Russia, are impossible. But by the end of the century, probably we will come close to this. And. Um, as we have droughts and hard rains, it uh, tells us about the uh, forest fires. And also we have uh, big high risks of uh, floods. All of this uh, leads to uh, instability of traditional activities, such as uh, reindeer herding, hunting, fishing. Uh, collecting berries and mushrooms. And all such conditions are very negative for the health of people. For example, uh, reindeer herders in uh, Finland they had problems only once in three or four years, but now uh, in one winter they can have only uh, three in one winter, they can have three times uh, this ice coverage on the uh, snow, which makes problematic uh, food for uh, the reindeers. And all these waves uh, that I have mentioned before are very negative for the health of uh, people. And these climate changes, they also um, can lead to the rise of uh, parasites in this region. Among them, uh, parasites can, uh, are moving to the north now, from the south. On the other hand, uh, the rise of the temperature is uh, good because we'll have more comfortable summers, more comfortable, we'll have more conditions for the infrastructure. However, this will also lead to its uh, fast uh, degradation. And that's when uh, we have decided on the example of Lavozera village uh, to create, to build a strategy that would be adapted to uh, the climate change for the people of settlements. And the initiator was, was the center of uh, indigenous peoples of the north who uh, contacted people from the Lavozera village and his ideas were supported in this place and we invited specialists from um, Russian Academy of Sciences and I hope we will also um, draw some other researchers and of course the aim is to minimize the negative effects of the climate change and to use uh, new possibilities to provide a good uh, livelihood for uh, local people and the uh, goals are to estimate modern changes of the climate, to estimate um, the Oksana Nikolaevna, you have more than you have if less than one minute. We also need to estimate um, the possibilities of people getting uh, adapted to that. Here we can see an example of how we estimated the vulnerability of people. On the first picture. Uh, you have the table 
However, this is how the program uh, put it. Uh, after that, we started uh, where we can find support and resources to uh, realize for the realization of this program. Sorry. I forgot to say next slide. And here, this is how to prepare to the adaptation. And the next, please. So here you have uh, fragments of the short, uh, short term plan. You see the events, you see the participants in the second column, and you have the um, years. And the adaptation of the to the climate uh, cannot be separated from um, development, sustainable development of the local communities. So what's next? First of all, uh, wide discussions, strategies, then um, a getting agreement, uh, searching for partners, searching for funds, uh, conducting additional researches, then planning certain events, then uh, holding the events themselves, estimating results and uh, building new plans. So thank you very much for your attention. Have a very good climate. Thank you, Oksana Nikolaevna. You have shared very interesting information from Murmansk with us. Unfortunately, we are a little bit uh, out of time. That's why I would like to report on the, the role of protected areas in maintenance of the traditional lifestyle of people in the north. I have to say that in Russia, the system of protected areas uh, is already over 100 years old. The first protected area in Yakutia appeared in 1969, although first ideas uh, appeared after the Second World War. And I would like to tell you briefly about the state system of these protected areas and how it helps to uh, safeguard the nature and to keep the balance between consumption of nature and the interests of local population. Uh, Yakutia is the largest region of Russia, over 3 million square kilometers. Yakutia is the leader in the country. Over 38% of the territory is occupied by uh, different protected areas. In our country, it functions so as it, uh, they are uh, um, into three types. Uh, there are federal, regional, and municipal territories. Uh, what's the difference between federal and regional? If you look at the slide, you can see the categories. Uh, our federal protected areas are represented by reserves that have a very strict regime, uh, including for local people. The second category, national parks, it depends on zoning, they can do some economic activities, and uh, the state uh, species management area. Uh, the specifics of our system is that we mostly have a very interesting category which allowed us, which we launched here in the Yakutia thanks to our law uh, adopted in 2011. It, it's a regional law on protected areas. So we have a very interesting category which is called resource reserve. Uh, which uh, allow us to be very flexible to regime. Uh, in this photo, you can see resource reserve of Amma. You have a zone of uh, traditional land use, the green one, and the red one is the zone of total rest, which is quiet zone. Mm, so in a 
every territory, uh, there, in every district, there are such protected areas that serve the balance between local population and uh, the resource. Uh, developers. For example, in zone of quiet, uh, of quiet uh, any activities are totally prohibited. Uh, but still, uh, next to it, we have a zone of traditional land use, which is reindeer herding, traditional hunting, fishing, uh, and there are agreements for that, uh, signed with uh, the authorities, uh, so, we have such a system that allows us to have uh, quite good results. Why it's important? Because we know that, in fact, economic uh, basis of the Arctic, uh, economic sustainability of the Arctic uh, is connected with uh, industrial development. That's why we had to create this sustainable system of protected areas that would allow us to save the nature, because the local population uh, lives in uh, rural areas that depend on natural resources around which they live. And all of the the protected areas, depending on their category, uh, have different aims. Federal ones, they have a strict regime. If it's a national park, it's recreational activities, environmental tourism. But if uh, we talk about a regional uh, ter protected ter territories, it's like resource reserves, natural monuments, national Mm, parks. And uh, so these, this system allows us to protect landscapes, to protect resources, including hunting resources, to protect uh, the habitats of rare species, to save them for future generations. And uh, there are some projects done together with the state. Uh, they are done for the future uh, that can be later used as resources by population. A very exciting project on uh, expansion of the range and increase in the number of musk oxen in the tundra of Yakutia. It's been running since 1996. Almost all Arctic regions are involved, and uh, musk oxen were introduced there. You see it in the middle picture. It's a very Arctic animal. It has a very good wool, uh, which is one of the most expensive materials in the world. And uh, in Canada, there were settlements uh, that uh, only get their main income from this musk oxen wool and uh, also mm, manufacturing some products. Maybe we can also use it in Yakutia. Uh, then, of course, it's meat when we have enough population. Um, unfortunately, wild reindeer uh, is decreasing dramatically, so maybe these empty ecosystems can be used uh, for musk oxen. Another interesting project is the wood bison that was reintroduced in Yakutia together with Elk Island Park in Canada. Uh, they were introduced into central Yakutia when we have enough population of them. Uh, right now it's a uh, protected species, but in future it also can be used in agriculture for breeding. Uh, and uh, agriculture. Of course, there are a lot uh, more of other projects that uh, allow us to enhance our resources, and I will finish here a little bit uh, ahead of time, and I will give the floor to Aital Yakovlev, associate professor, faculty of history, nephew, and he will speak about cultural globalization and traditional culture. Please keep to your time limits. 
Добрый день, коллеги. Hello, colleagues. Так, видно, да, презентация? Can you see my presentation? Да, мы хорошо... А, мы слышим вас хорошо. We can hear you. Но презентация не видно, да? But you don't see my presentation, right? Пока нет. Not yet. Презентация видна? Can you see it now? Пока не видим. Not yet. А, пока презентацию вашу не видим. А, она загружается долго, наверное. Maybe it takes time for it to upload. Maybe it's heavy. Все появилась ваша презентация. Yes, now we see it. Айтал Владимирович, можете приступать. You can start. Айтал Игоревич, вы нас слышите? Мы видим вашу can презентацию. Can you hear можете us? Ваш, uh, we can доклад. see your presentation. You can start. Uh -huh. Так, пока мы решаем техническую замену, тогда давайте передам waiting, слово следующему нашему спикеру, Яковлеву speaker, Капиталине Максимовне, uh, Капиталина Яковлева, наук, доцент, the associate professor, faculty of history of NFU, with her report on preservation of the traditional culture of the Yesei Yakuts in the context of globalization. Hello, colleagues. I welcome all the participants of this section. And today I would like to tell you about protecting the culture of YC Yakuts. This material was collected as a result of field research in Yesei settlement in Krasnoyarsk region of Russia. In spring of 2014, uh, we had an expedition uh, and uh, projects of interdisciplinary study of cultures of the north of the Nefu. And we visited uh, the Yakuts in Yesei. I, th I think everybody knows that Yesei Yakuts are Yakuts who live in Krasnoyarsk region. At the, nevertheless, despite that they are so far from the Yakuts of Yakutia, they have their own culture, which is uh, uh, not exactly like the culture of the Yakuts in Yakutia. So, as an example, I will show you a cross of one of the elders of Yesei. She is very famous among the locals and she has uh, the cross that everybody in Yakutia knows. It's a traditional decoration. But this decoration doesn't have a cross itself because she said it was buried with her mother because her mother's soul was in that cross. So this decoration is worn by women and if metal decorations, uh, for example, in Yakutia, we never bury people with metal decorations, jewelry, but uh, they have a different. Uh, we also have uh, the very uh, authentic traditional clothes, 
uh, that combines elements of uh, maybe a Venki culture, culture. and uh, these uh, costumes were very popular during Soviet times with beads, fur. Can, can you move your slides, please, because I think they're stuck. Also, we see this uh, sun symbol carpets. They are very popular among the Yesei Yakuts, although in traditional culture of Yakuts we don't have it. And uh, uh, there are some examples of this culture being different. It's not a culture of cattle breeders. It's a culture of northern Yakuts. There is no reveration of Sergei tethering post, for example. We didn't see it because uh, Yakuts, wherever they come, they put up a Sergei. For the Yakuts of the Republic, uh, Sergei is uh, really a sacred object. There is uh, the photo of Yesei Lake. It's a sacred lake. We were there in winter when it was frozen. It's considered to be alive and has its own spirit. And uh, you should always treat it with respect. If you ask for something, you come to the lake and ask it. Around the lake, uh, the economy also revolves. Uh, sometimes, uh, some time ago, they uh, were engaged in reindeer herding, hunting, fishing, but elders say that uh, fishing was only done by those who were not able to do reindeer herding. And there were so many reindeers that you could not even count them. And nobody lived in settlements, they lived with the herds. And now that the situation has changed, if uh, before reindeer were used for a very interesting thing called tardi, which is cargo uh, transportation. Uh, so this uh, process was very long. So within one tardi you could actually have a child or die or marry. Because it's a mountainous terrain, and in some places, uh, people would uh, tow uh, the sledge and just would let the reindeer go. And right now, we have a road there. And right now, uh, reindeer are used mostly at festivals. Or during rituals. In Yisei itself, there are no reindeer, domestic reindeer. And uh, local uh, people, Yevdakia Asukostok, uh, is the only person who has reindeer near to the settlement. She has only maybe seven, 70, uh, but before there were thousands of them. And she keeps them for them for herself because she's used to it. And also she sells them for you know, festivals, rituals. But she's uh, uh, more than 80 years. She came especially to talk to us. Capitalina, you have one minute. 
And when we said we want to uh, go back with her, she said, oh, it's going to be too difficult for you to travel on snowmobile. Uh, to mention the women, they are the basis of homes. Mm. Uh, medicine, healthcare, it's all women. And men are engaged in hunting wild reindeer. So in settlement, you only see women, children, and elders. And it's interesting that kids, boys, after fifth grade, they don't want to study. They need to be hunters. They need to learn hunting rather than studying. And uh, in modern days, globalization not just opened for, you say, Yakuts, uh, the Western world. Of course, they have opened it, but the Internet brought to, you say, Yakuts, they are uh, brothers in Yakutia. Um, uh, before Internet arrived, they asked to send uh, some CDs with music via mail. But now Internet is everywhere. They can read uh, uh, books in Yakut language. They can listen to Yakut music. They can uh, uh, explore Yakut culture. Now even they are costume. Uh, their costumes are changing, uh, and they are now more similar to what we have here. And uh, there is a very um, strong interaction going on now. Cultural interaction. Globalization impacts not only transformation of culture, uh, not only culture in our republic. We cannot define drawbacks and advantages. We cannot say our culture is getting better. And uh, the Yisei Yakuts are becoming more like the Yakutian Yakuts. But on the other hand, maybe they're losing their unique culture that they safeguarded for centuries. Thank you. That's it. Kapitalina, we go back to Aital. Yakovlev uh, with his uh, presentation if uh, we have solved technical problems. Can you see my presentation? Can you see it now? Yes, we see it. I am very sorry for the technical problems. I, in my report, I will try to answer such a fundamental question as about uh, modern Yakutia and some socio-cultural processes that are taking place here. And uh, this question I was trying to answer in my uh, research. These are the question of new traditional culture. And in search of the answers, um, we have uh, stopped on the definition of traditional culture and globalization. So what do we understand under traditional uh, culture? As, a, as an anthropologist, I um, can't really say describe it in a very easy way. I understand that it's a culture of people who inhabit uh, the remote northern areas. On this uh, picture, you can see a traditional Yakut Alas land. And when we say culture, we understand um, a, a certain way of life, a certain uh, livelihood that was formed 
on a certain land under certain uh, climate uh, conditions and we talk, when we talk about Yakut traditional culture we understand how human adapted to a certain landscape and climate and when we talk about uh, the nations that inhabit Yakutia these are of course um, reindeer husbandry fishing uh, horses husbandry hunting and in this uh, picture we see a Baliktach village we see uh, horses cows and young boys on motorbikes so this is the modern situation in Yakutia and when we try to define um, what is happening now with culture and which uh, cultural processes are taking place in Yakutia, we talk about um, cultural globalization. I remember that back in the 90s uh, they used to use uh, only globalization term, but uh, nowadays as a researcher and along with my colleagues, Historic, uh, historians and uh, sociologists were trying to put it in a more um, in a more uh, sharp way so I use uh, a definition cultural globalization and by thus I understand the change of identification how a uh, human is changing how the uh, self-identification is changing and when we talk about modern Yakutia we should talk about uh, issues of traditional livelihood that we are having because according to the Ross Stat, statistics data, um, we can say that more than 66% of uh, modern Yakut people, they live in modern conditions and uh, the traditional livelihood is not that spread anymore. And when we used to ask a question, who are you uh, from a general you could uh, resident they would say not a reindeer herder for example or hunter I would say they would say I'm a teacher I'm a pensioner I'm a doctor and so on that's why we can see that there was a big change in identification it's not even a transformation but it was a change there and when we say about cultural globalization I would like to draw your attention to the picture um, this picture of um, was taken in Krimske Han and this uh, picture shows us cultural globalization in the upper corner we see so-called lampa like a lamp it's a symbol of uh, Allah and uh, on, uh, down below we see the cross so the, def the definition of cultural globalization and identification changes for historians it is um, opening as a new field and in, even in our 21st century um, this uh, term as culture from the point of view of archaeologists it is a certain material or material culture that was formed uh, in the past. And if we talk about how uh, cultural uh, globalization affects us, how can we feel it? How can we define it? Where are the borders between transformation and changes because of the cultural globalization? Uh, of the people who live in the Arctic is first of all of course a transformation of traditional transformation of uh, traditional culture it means 
There is such a definition, it is a wide definition, it is uh, changes in time, so to say, and if we put it in a simple way, it means that it is sort of an adaptation of cultural, uh, of traditional culture to the modern times, meaning that how the traditional culture has been adapting to the modern times. For example, um, this is the picture uh, taken by uh, Jochensen, is a um, and you can see how it, it was changing under the processes of urbanization. For example, our um, Yakutsk city Osohoi takes place on modern squares, not in Allah's, not in the uh, lands, but in Yakutsk uh, we can see how um, they perform this Osohoi on a city, on an urban um, place. And uh, the second thing that is affected by the cultural globalization is daily life of people. First of all, this is the um, uh, how the uh, person work, where he or she works, and how they um, recreate, how they uh, have rest. And now, for example, uh, if someone says, I'm a teacher, you can see how their uh, daily life has changed. And more often, they would say they are just uh, teachers, not hunters or something like this. And the last point is how where we can see the cultural globalization is, of course, on a cultural landscape. You know that a human is a subject of culture, and if we talk about Yakutsk or other uh, regional centers, uh, we have uh, we have uh, traditional places where they celebrate traditional holidays, and I would even say modern cult. Um, complexes, for example, Ishatin in the city of Yakutsk, where we celebrate Isekh, the summer holidays, and um, this tradition of celebrating uh, Isekh is coming from the government down and up from the people so they have sort of a dialogue and here you can see how the cultural landscape has been changing under the cultural globalization and trying to answer this question we use such definition as cultural shock is the conflict of old and new forms and social uh, problems and uh, social uh, social problems that we are facing now in the 21st century is can be called as cultural shock it is a, a they try traditional people they try to answer try to find their uh, identity and it goes uh, deep down to a person identification which can um, become a conflict so a human can become sort of an actor of such processes and to conclude I would like to say that all the people that inhabit Yikutia these are highly adaptive people and if a human cannot adapt to the changes uh, it will not, he or she will not survive the conditions of the severe Arctic. At some point it is good, at the same time it's bad. And in the 21st century we can say that we are in the process of transitivity, uh, which of course uh, resulted uh, by climate changes, uh, cultural changes and cultural globalization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you dear participants. Uh, we had, uh, we spent in great two hours together we've listened to 11 reports unfortunately we have no time for a discussion however I, your wishes your uh, comments will be receiving them for the uh, next hours and we will um, hand them to the organizers so that they would include it into our um, resolution thank you very much I hope that all the information that you have listened to today 
state will find a uh, realization and on behalf of the organizer and on behalf of the Department of UNESCO. Nephew, I would like to wish you fruitful uh, researches and we would like to thank our uh, technicians, our translators, interpreters for uh, uh, helping us with uh, the organizing session and thank you very much. See you.